Hey, DM Dango here with another review from the DM's Guild. This time we're looking at the Starlight Relic by Ashley Warren. What starts with a song ends in ruins. Hey everyone, before I get started on the review, if you could remember to comment and like and subscribe on this video and remember to use my affiliate links for the DM's Guild products that I review, that would really help me out a lot in terms of kind of supporting the channel. Thank you, and let's get into it. The Starlight Relic by Ashley Warren. The Starlight Relic is uh, kind of a combination of a couple of different adventure types. You've got uh, the basic snatch and grab. That's kind of the main thrust of the adventure. You are told by um, your quest giver to go, in go into the forest and go and retrieve this magical item that could potentially stop a larger war. Um, there is an undercurrent in the entire adventure, and a lot of the ones that Ashley Warren does, of this war between the angels and the demons, basically. And then there's war has been ongoing for a long time, with neither side gaming around over the other. So you have this good backdrop to kind of fill in. And if you buy all the other adventures from Ashley Warren, and you should, they're all really nice and really good, it gives you a good um, like basis for multiple adventures strung together, while still giving you that compartmentalized feel that a lot of adventurers and a lot of players really like. A lot of players don't like the idea of this long campaign where you're doing, you're, you're going from place to place and traveling around and doing these grandiose things. Some of them just want to unwind and do very simple, like, I want to go into a forest, kill some stuff, and come out. I want to have a little roleplay encounters with various different NPCs that you create. And that's where this, this adventure shines really well. It strikes the good balance between that kind of, I have a larger campaign setting, but I've also kind of given you a compartmentalized encounter or a compartmentalized adventure. There's nothing here that says, that says you can't run this um, without the rest of them, but it slots nicely in with the rest of them so that you get a greater understanding. A lot like some of the better Marvel movies, if you think about it. Some of them stand alone very well on their own, others don't, obviously, um, because you need all that history. Now, moving on from that, we have a lot of, um, in terms of the overall adventure, we have, it's sectioned out. You have the very first start bit, which is you start out in the city, you get your quest, and you're also presented with another part interested party who's looking for the same, well, looking for the same item, or at least looking for the location where the item is, is stored. In addition to that, you are also presented with a potential spy, somebody chasing you or looking for you. Now, obviously, there's a lot of things going on here for the DM to manage, but it's not overwhelming in any way. The kind of thing that is looking and chasing and, look and kind of spotting you isn't something the DM has to manage very often. He just needs to kind of keep in mind uh, or sorry, they need to just keep in mind that this thing is here and is watching. Now, in addition to that, once you go, so, sorry, once you go from there, you go into the second chapter. So you just end up in the woods and you start going into it and start traversing through it. Now, this is where a choice happens. You can split, you can go the way that, you know, your original quest giver told you to go, or you can go where this new person told you to go. And it kind of diverges slightly in terms of the types of encounters you end up getting and the th things you see and the things you start to do. And it's really interesting in terms of the way that kind of plays out. Yes, eventually you do end up back at the same place, but it's nice to have that kind of player agency driven choice. You can go this way or you can go this way. In the end, you're still trying to get to the same spot, but it's a question of who you trust, as it were, or who you choose to ally with, I guess is the right way of putting it. After that, you're finally at the, you know, the ruins, the, the location of the MacGuffin, the location of the Starlight Relic. And then resulting in that, of course, you always have the encounter before you get the final treasure, as it were. And it's a good little encounter, nothing too crazy or dangerous, but a, a, a nice, nice boss fight, as it were. But that's not where it ends. After that, the interested party still wants the relic. They want the thing that you now have, and now you have to make a choice. Do I give it to the person who gave it to me, who asked me to get it for them? Do I give it to this new person, who I've just met, but has helped me through the forest, potentially? Or, third option, do I keep it? 
as a party? Do I do I just snatch the relic for myself, given its nature, powers, and abilities? I like that. I like the choices being presented there. And now, um, it, this segues nicely into the things that I like. So, what did I like specifically about the Starlight Relic? I love the premise. I love the idea of going into a forest and getting something. But it's not just that. It's the premises that follow on from that. I like the idea of multiple people trying to get this thing simultaneously and then the players being presented with a choice at the end to figure out who they give it to. No, no choice in this instance is wrong. There is no wrong choice here. It's all shades of gray. Every party has an interest in why they want this. And it's a good thing to see. It's a good thing to see these morally gray, morally ambiguous choices that present players with real problems as they work out, well, why should I give this to this person? Should I have? And, and it can really lead to some really good and interesting role play. Take note, morally gray choices are always better than simply good versus evil because it's much harder for a player to justify, especially as a character, why they chose one or the other. It gives them a lot of time to think about what the way their characters would react to these situations, why they would do certain things. Now, very mercenary characters will go, well, who's going to pay me the most? And that's fine. But having that roleplay experience enforces the roleplay, enforces the character, and allows them to grow and to be better roleplayers. I think. Characters are really well defined. They're really well structured. They're really well kind of like um, characterized, I guess is the right word here. Although I don't, I was trying to think of a better word. Anyways, but they're really well characterized and they, it gives them a good depth um, for you to kind of pull as a, as a DM to kind of say, well, how does this character behave in this situation? What did they do and how do they act? One of the really good things about this model is there's a lot of interesting handouts inside. Um, there's a lot of things like um, you get the letter, you get um, the set of, a set of runes that go along with some uh, a puzzle that you can um, present to your players as part of the um, trek through the forest. Um, you get the um, you get the song itself, and I actually found out that the song, or at least the uh, the melody, is actually in a YouTube video that's linked in the DM's Guild. Now it's not obviously linked in the DM's Guild um, document because that's not really possible. But it is nice to see that it is, at least you can get it. You can play it for your players and say, this is what the, sound, the music sounds like, if you were to play it on a thing. And you can, if you're really brave, you could potentially try and actually sing this. Um, now, those are the, like, kind of the end of the handouts and where the kind of things. Um, I love, like I said before, I love the ideas of competing parties, but that competing parties are not necessarily directly competing. Um, it's always, it's too often that you have a big bad and he directly smashes into you. In this case, they're not really competing with you. They're more aligned with you until the very end. Each encounter in the overall arc also feels like very good progression. It's not just a case of hard encounter, hard encounter, hard encounter. There's a nice gradual curve up to a very nice like end encounter. I love the simple mechanic, the simple puzzles, um, or the simple puzzle that was in the trees. It's not difficult enough to frustrate a player and there are multiple solutions and multiple ways you could start triggering the solution. It means that it's it's kind of a neat thing and you can kind of very quickly like poke a player here or there. Um, so the final reward that you get if you choose one path is these little offerings from your original quest giver. And they're really, they're different. They're not the case of where you get mold, like here's a magic item from the DMG, yay, or here's some gold. It's, well, here's some gold, and I'm a crafter, I'm a I'm a artisan of wood, and I do some magic. I can give you this cup that will give you a bonus uh, to survival, or I can give you this model ship that gives you a bonus to history. It's not. It's a nice little touch. It's a tiny little nudge, and at level seven, it's basically doubling the proficiency bonus. So it's nice to see something more unique in that in that aspect. So what didn't I like? So I felt that the combat encounters were a little vanilla. I felt that there wasn't a lot of interesting or unique environmental or more interesting and unique um, challenges to be presented to the players in terms of the way that the encounter says. The, the final monster, however, is an interesting encounter in of itself because of the nature of the monster. It's 
that it is. I'm trying to avoid spoilers so that players who are watching this don't um, get spoiled and don't uh, plan ahead, basically. Um, potentially because I might be writing for this line for players and I really don't want them to be spoiled. So there is reasons for me not saying things. But I digress. Um, yeah, so the, the event, I felt that the combat encounters didn't have enough interest or variety to them in terms of the way that they're presented. They're very much, here's a monster, fight it, kill it. Um, saying that, I think that in terms of what the, the overall adventure is trying to say here is that role play and exploration are kind of the core focus of these, this adventure. They are the pillars that we hold up above the other two. And that kind of happens with a lot of adventures. It's rare to see one that kind of holds up all three perfectly um, aligned across the board. And it's fine to have that, but you need to be aware of that when purchasing. So that's why I say it here. Um, I felt that the map of the Magra district, in terms of what you get, um, it felt underutilized. There didn't seem to be a whole, like, a reason to have it. It just seems like, here's some names of some streets, here's some, here's where things are. Um, but there's not really a reason to have the map beyond just having a map. Utilize it more, have maybe a random combat encounter or a random encounter occur during that that would ever require a map that beyond, that goes beyond theater of the mind that you don't necessarily need. Um, I felt that I would have loved to see proper, like a sheet music handout. That's a minor thing, and I actually did do that, and I'll probably put my copy over there, um, up in the thing, um, just because I thought it would be really neat, like a little handout to give to my players. Um, I also thought that it would have been nice to include at least a map for the final area, um, because it's very specifically descriptive in terms of what's in there, and how it's kind of laid out, and where things are. So it would have been nice to have that final map to have it there. And I've got a map that I've done for World 20. So basically for this entire adventure, I've um, integrated this adventure into World 20 as part of doing my review process. And I think that's what I'll do going forward because it seems to be a really good way of figuring out where where various holes are and things that I need for that that kind of system. Now that's not to say that you couldn't run this with app, like a live game without all of this stuff. But for a virtual tabletop, you kind of have to, you have to have it basically because otherwise it just gets very, very complicated very quickly because over the, you always lose a little bit, unfortunately. The other, the final thing that I didn't like was um, there should always be, when you do handouts, uh, maps, or any kind of thing like that, um, that requires either printing off or um, um, separation, always separate the files always have like a separate um like a uh, file as part of the dm's guild like download it's just nice to do um it's nice to have that kind of separate here's here's your you know here's your uh, here's your maps here's your handouts here you go it makes it easy for virtual tabletop integration it also makes it easier to print out as well um so my rating where do i put this against all of the other things i reviewed well, I'm going to use my perk system again because I think it's a really good way of reviewing adventure models. It gives a good way of them. So perk is uh, polish, exploration, role play, and combat. So the three pillars of D&D plus a polish one where I've gone, well, these things don't really belong into any of these columns, but they do add to the adventure. They make it easier to DM. And that's kind of my big polish one is how much extra work did I need to do as a DM to run this? Now, I run almost exclusively virtually, so that gives me certain things that I do differently to somebody who's playing live. But it's kind of always going to be that way in terms of the way different DMs run things. Some require more maps and they want that extra thing. Some exclusively run in theater of the mind. Neither is right or wrong, they're just different styles, but I'm just giving you my kind of opinion here. Uh, so let's start, let's start backwards, because I always like to do that. So perk, so C for combat. Combat, I think, in this adventure is actually the weakest pillar. But I think it's done that way by design. I think exploration and roleplay are the kings here. They are much better represented. They are much better kind of focused on. And that's fine. Combat here, though, I'm going to have to give a four. I don't think there's enough interest here to say this is a, this is a tier five like adventure for combat. If you're looking for a combat-based adventure, if you're looking for something more interesting, unique, or challenging for your players, this isn't the one for you. Now, saying that, however, moving on to roleplay. Roleplay, however, much better. 
the characterization, the things that are available, the things that happen during the adventure, and all of the different various threads lead to a lot of very interesting roleplay potential possibilities. Now, obviously, this always depends on players' interaction and their kind of ability to do things and kind of interact with NPCs. If you have a bunch of murder hobos, not a real good idea to stick them on this adventure because they'll just massacre everything. It still be, might be a lot of fun, but they might not get as much out of it as they ordinary, as somebody, as a group that was more roleplay heavy. So for the roleplay side of things, it's a five. Characters are very good. The, the quest lines and the interest and the way they interact is very interesting and gives like a lot of potential opportunities. Exploration. There is a lot of very good opportunities. There are multiple pathways through to get to your goal, to get to your end. And even beyond that, the choices you make after you've gotten your thing add to that exploration. How do I, what do I do with this thing? I've got it now. What do I do with it? How do I, what are my choices? What are my, what are my explorable options? Because I always, because some people tag roleplay with, oh, it's also the choices your characters can make as part of it. Well, kind of, but kind of not. Because in looking at exploration, you're talking about how do I explore the world and choices and invariably what happens as a result of those choices are all part of exploration. So for exploration, I give it a five as well. Really good way of kind of pulling different things apart and kind of moving and shaking it up. Finally, P for polish. Now, like I mentioned before, the maps aren't in separate files um, and the handouts aren't in separate files. So that dings, that, that, that hits a little bit for me. Um, it's just a nice to have kind of thing. However, saying that, the fact that the handouts that are presented here are interesting and unique and different, and in addition to that, even though it's not mentioned in the product itself, I think it should be, is the song that goes along with it. And she's actually created a playlist on her YouTube channel for this adventure, which I think she should, I wish she would like um, advertise, because it was a really good little playlist for those players that play live, because you can just get this running, start it up, and pick your you know, various things and go, here's the things that the author thought would go well with his adventure. And they're really interesting little, like, little playlists. I think it's like six tracks, something like that on YouTube that you can look at and see like, oh, that's what they're thinking kind of thing. There's some really good things here that are added. I would have still liked to have seen, like I said before, I would have liked to see some more battle maps in terms of, uh, for the virtual tabletop crowd. So for Roll20 and for, um, Fantasy Grounds, uh, and there are other virtual tabletops out there. So yeah, so for, for P, I, I give it a four. It's not quite perfect. There are things that could be done that make it better. Um, there, but the things that are, are in there are really, really nice. I really like them. So we've got, um, so in total for our total score, we've got a four, and then two fives, and then a four. So that gives me 18. Divide that by four, that's 4.5. So on the DMs Guild, I'll be rating it a 4 because they don't have a system that allows me to do 0.5s or to do anything like that. Um, but I think it's still a really good adventure, especially if your party is interested in roleplaying and exploration. If they're very combat heavy, maybe give this one a pass or look at adding some different or interesting and unique challenges to them, um, to the various encounters that are present. Thank you and peace out.